we noticed traditionally, uh, you know, coffee price was very stable. Uh, Australian dollar was very stable and access to product was extremely um, like available. Easy. It was always yeah. there. You could find coffee. It was always around. And and what we've noticed in the market with fluctuations changing and the consistency of those fluctuations, so the consistency of higher prices and the consistency of um, like scarcity and access. And that scarcity is is coming down to, in, in what we're seeing in Australia, the biggest part is what we define as like a spot coffee. So mm-hmm. the availability of spot coffee in Australia has drastically reduced. And the biggest driver is the cost to store has increased by about three to five times what it traditionally was. So for the for an importer or a producer who was bringing coffee to Australia that was unsold, this would be spot and they'd sit it here and then try and sell it to roasters. And roasters had that luxury of knowing I don't need a forward plan. I don't need to book out contracts because there'll always be spot and it'll always be a consistent price. That's not there anymore. Um, and it's not coming back. This episode is proudly brought to you by Mapper Forwards Workshop. It's time to become a coffee consultant. Learn how to diversify your revenue streams and create freedom from your day job while saying goodbye to that alarm clock forever by becoming a consultant within the coffee industry or directly to consumers who have shifted towards home brewing and home roasting. Protect your income from challenging times in the coffee value chain by taking this course today. Go to mapperforward.coffee forward slash workshops or click the link in the show notes for details. Welcome to the Daily Coffee Pro by Map It Forward, friends. I'm your host, Lee Safar, and this is episode one of a brand new five-part series with Caleb Holstein from Green Square. Welcome to the podcast for the first time, Caleb. Thanks for having me, Lee. So, folks, if you don't know about Caleb, you should know about Caleb. Caleb is, and and I want to take a second here to uh, tip my hat to Caleb. The reason is because there are few people who take the journey. Let me say it a different way. There are many people in the world that have ideas. There are many people in the world that talk about those ideas. There are many people who then go and tell everybody that they've got this idea and they're going to start a business. Very few people start that business and have the grit to weather all of the challenges that are ahead of them. And I often say to people, being in business is going to teach you everything you never wanted to know about yourself. Every one of my clients that's listening to this or anyone who's been to anything that Mapper Forward does has heard that and everybody nods. Everyone who's owned a business and has had it for an, uh, an extended period of time nods. But you didn't just open a business. You took an idea and you decided to, and it, and it wasn't even necessarily a unique idea. It was an idea that has its own flavor. So on that side of it, it's unique. But you tried to solve a problem that other people have tried to solve. And most people give up on solving that problem ahead of time. And you did not. And so, ladies and gentlemen, Caleb, I, I am very proud to introduce you to Caleb if you don't know uh, what he does. Caleb, tell people about you and about Green Square. Yeah, well, firstly, thank you for the lovely introduction, Lee. Um, the first thing is, I'm not a I'm not a man alone on this journey uh, doing what we're doing with software. Uh, I do have an amazing team of founders, so I'm the face and they're the guts of the place. So I have to give a shout out to the rest of my team to start <laughs> off. But um, as Lee was mentioning, we've we founded a, a agricultural software provider, um, which is dedicated to the green coffee sector, um, with our first release of software being Green Square, which is focused around uh, assisting coffee roasters to be able to manage their entire green coffee procurement, um, regardless of their supplier, their producer, whoever they're working with, and just empowering them to digitally manage and track all of their coffee needs. Okay, great. And you're based in Sydney. No, you're not based in Sydney. You're based in the Central Coast. You're based in... Every- Everyone will it's think Sydney, it's Sydney. It's Sydney for everyone <laughs> in the world, but everyone in Australia, it is the Central Coast. And I'm a, I'm a, I'm a tragic uh, Central Coast boy, so I'm always very proud of it. God's country, as they say. Um, so yes, in this yeah. series, we're going to be talking about the new normal for coffee roasters. Uh, in particular, we're 
uh, with a particular focus on green coffee. So there, you know, we've been talking a lot about the coffee crisis in this on this podcast, uh, despite the fact that you know there's a lot of silence from organisations like the SCA and like a whole bunch of places that refuse to acknowledge that there's a crisis going on, um, and they have their reasons for it, and good for them. And you know, I'm I'm not disrespecting them in any way, but folks, if you're still asking the question if there's a coffee crisis. Um, it's a problem because for many, many reasons, we're in crisis. In this, that crisis has led to there being a new normal. And there's a new normal on many different fronts. And Caleb, in this episode, we're going to be looking at what the new normal is for coffee roasters compared to the past when it comes to purchasing green coffee. So what, what did green coffee purchasing look like traditionally? Yeah, so um, obviously purchasing green coffee has a lot of similarities no matter where you are in the world, um, yeah. but there is also unique perspective. So obviously with my expertise and my kind of experience being uh, from the Australian market, I can speak to that quite quite in depth, I think. Um, yeah. But it is there is a lot of similarities that do apply in other, other markets as well. But particularly in Australia, we noticed traditionally, uh, you know, coffee price was very stable. Uh, Australian dollar was very stable and access to product was extremely um, like available. Easy. It was always yeah. there. You could find coffee. It was always around. And and what we've noticed in the market with fluctuations changing and the consistency of those fluctuations, so the consistency of higher prices and the consistency of um, like scarcity and access. And that scarcity is is coming down to in, in what we're seeing in Australia, the biggest part is what we define as like a spot coffee. So mm -hmm. the availability of spot coffee in Australia has drastically reduced. And the biggest driver is the cost to store has increased by about three to five times what it traditionally was. So for the for an importer or a producer who was bringing coffee to Australia that was unsold, this would be spot and they'd sit it here and then try and sell it to roasters. And roasters mm -hmm. had that luxury of knowing I don't need a forward plan. I don't need to book out contracts because there'll always be spot and it'll always be a consistent price. That's not there anymore. Um, and it's not coming back. Um, it's not going to, the the stock levels aren't going to reproduce because the cost of it's not there and it's not sustainable. So it's a big, big dynamic shift for roasters having to plan a lot further ahead and having mm. to review their costing and pricing structures because the, the base costs are, um, are much higher. So let's break that down a little bit for, for people who might be new into this. So basically, if I understand you correctly, spot coffee was co is coffee that if you're, let's say I'm a roaster, I thought that the coffee business is doing well. I thought that the coffee that I had uh, purchased is going to get me through till the end of next month. I've only got enough coffee that's going to get me through to the end of this month. That's fine. I'm going to call the importer and I'm going to say, I need another pallet. Uh, and usually I could call them. I knew I was going to pay extra for that because it's like buying something off the shelf. Uh, but what ends up happening, and, and that used to be fine, but now the cost of that importer having to make sure that they've got extra is so expensive that it's no longer worth them having that extra stock to be able to give you um, so they don't no longer carry it. Am I right? Yeah, yeah, correct. It, it's definitely that as a kind of a, a summary of it. There, yeah. There is still spot coffee, but it's gone from like I would say it's probably at like 20 to 30% the volume that was historically stored in the country. And it, that other 70% is the real big challenge that's kind of hitting roasters going, right. there's just not as much. And the nuance to that is also, folks, the kind of spot coffee that's available right now is very different to the kind of spot coffee that's always been available historically. If you want spot coffee that's at like an 86 or even 85, 86, 87, you're more likely to find spot coffee that's scoring that cup score than you are to find a spot coffee that's an 81 to an 84. Uh, that's the experience that we've been seeing around the world. Is that the same as what you're seeing in Australia? Similar, yeah. We're, we're noticing, I think it's hard to say as a broad spectrum because it's not a warehouse I get to walk into and look at. Um, right. This is spread across multiple importers and, and, and kind of trading companies in the country. But we're seeing the pressure landing on the kind of lower end specialty blender options mm -hmm. um, 
just particularly with those being the ones that require the most volume from spot mm-hmm. traditionally. So as Lee's example was kind of uh, talking about, I might not have enough for the rest of the month. That is largely based around blend consumption. Yeah. We're feeling the pain at the moment. So how is it all? So what's the shift been caused by? It's a it's a combination of things. I think there's a lot of there's really like visual examples of this. So like there was the Brazil frost that we saw. I think it was twenty twenty, and we kind of twenty twenty one. So there was we visibly can see those things. That's a great mark of okay. Environmentally, there's been changes. We are seeing more um, like higher frequency of environmental effects with global warming and different things affecting crop production. We're seeing just another range of um, like shipping challenges. So the visual one that pops to everyone's mind is the Suez Canal. Um, That's not happening every week, but we're seeing things like uh, extra delays out of Ethiopian ports due to unrest in the Red Sea. And these things are just becoming more and more frequent. They were always happening in a supply chain, um, but now with the frequency they're they're kind of creating more challenges. And then the other side is the inconsistency in consumption. So with the pandemic, we saw a concern. So people were overbuying or underbuying because of a concern around fluctuation. So Mm. it is the perfect storm along with the commodity market varying quite rapidly and and kind of being extremely volatile. It's the perfect storm that all of these events are happening more often, more frequently and putting more pressure on coffee roasters. Yeah, people seem to think that like climate change is going to, when it comes to coffee, is just going to affect whether the trees have a high yield or not but when there's a El Nino or a La Nina it impacts the the sea levels uh in like Mm. the Panama Canal so whether the actual ships can go through the Panama Canal or not ends up having a big impact on what the cost of freighting your coffee is or whether how long it's going to take to get it to you all these things are real life concerns that affect not just the trees when it comes to to climate change it's a big deal yeah i think one thing just to touch on with like sea freight is we often look at it from our industry and think of us competing for space with other coffee providers we're competing for space on these container ships with everything everything. Um, the amount of sea freight that's increased over this, like since the pandemic and the and the mm. need for it, has just been rapid. That how much can a any coffee producer, not just you know coffee producer versus coffee producer or exporter versus exporter, how much can a coffee container be worth in comparison to a container of maybe some soft like some hardware tools for a technical yeah. like there is there is a cap on that. Yeah, and we're competing <laughs> kind of with this entire space. So yeah, it's it's challenging. Yeah. And I've got to say, Caleb, like props to you because there's been a real shift in your social media and you have really started um, informing people about like what's going on with uh, in, in with Yemen and and the ships that are, well, that can't come out of <laughs> Ethiopia. You've been really great at informing people about that. I've really enjoyed the content that you're putting out on that. Um, so people should follow you on social media if they want to get more information about that because that's a really important part of what it is to be a roaster these days, in my opinion, is being informed mm. is an important part of understanding what's happening with how you forecast coffee, uh, with how you're buying coffee, with understanding when your coffee is going to be available, not available. Is that, do you think that that's new? It's something I think has really become a new layer of being a coffee roaster. Is that something that you've observed? Yeah, for sure. Firstly, thank you for the lovely compliments on my content. Um, It's extremely cringe for me to be doing those. But um, (laughs) as I mentioned before, like you'll see my face on those pieces of content, but that content is backed by our amazing community of, of importers that we work with, roasters we work with, like the rest of our team. So I am, I'm the face, but there is an amazing team behind us who are helping us produce and get that out. All the dodgy editing is still done by me at the moment. But, um, Spoken but yeah, like a is, true leader. Is, uh, <laughs> but there is, there is more people who kind of advise uh-huh. and help us get these things. But the big shift that I've seen as a coffee roaster is we talked about like pre- previously in the market, it was a lot of consistency. There yeah. was a lot of availability and it was – it was quite easy to have access to a lot of things and understand what was going on because things weren't changing all the time. Now, as a coffee roaster, we're in volatility of market, we're in volatility of supply, we're in volatility of shipment, we're in volatility of quality. Everything's in in kind of constant flux that we need to find channels and communication streams that 
help inform us. And I think traditionally the coffee industry, in my opinion, hasn't been good at this across the board, mm. whether we don't have a standardized education structure. And I, anyone who knows me, I use this example all the time. If I want to become a chef, which I, I did at one point, I can go and I there is a standardized set of training that I can do to have that skill set and then to communicate with other people with that skill set. The coffee industry, we do not have that for a barista. We do not have that for a cafe owner. We do not have that for a roaster. We do not have that for a green buyer. So access to information and insight has always been about who you know, how you know them, where you know them. So the goal of what we're trying to do with our content and with our platform is democratize access to technology, information, and education. Um, mm -hmm. So that's kind of what we're trying to focus on. Yeah. Yeah, and everyone at the SCA just started yelling at their podcast apps or yelling <laughs> because in there are all these SCA certified courses that are supposed to bring everybody up to a standard. And um, yet when it comes to this kind of stuff, there isn't, there isn't the kind of education or adoption that I think is helping to empower people in what is necessary to adapt as quickly as is necessary to adapt. There is a massive gap and you're helping to fill it. I hope, you know, this podcast is helping to fill that gap. It's why we try and, and do this. Like this podcast is not recorded weeks and weeks in advance because things move so quickly now. Mm. Yeah. So, I, yeah. Go ahead. I think just one thing I'd like to touch on there quickly is uh, from my perspective, I don't associate any any like any wrongdoing or any mishap by our industry and this ability of having education. Our industry has grown, in my mind, really rapidly. And like, you know, I'm I'm young in the industry, but but having, you know, the ability of working with quite senior people and networking and understanding quite senior people who've been in our industry, it's rapid growth hasn't allowed for that education structure. So I I have hope still that we'll look back on this in 10, 15, 20 years, however long it will be. And our industry will have education structures until it does. Anyone who's trying to provide education is doing amazing work. So hats off to everyone in the space trying to elevate mm -hmm. and communicate. But I don't think it's I don't think it's a um, I don't think it's any particular wrongdoing except for the the age of our industry and the maturity of our industry as a whole um, that requires that time to be able to have those education things. So until then, you're left with us on podcasts or me on social media walking my dog talking about green coffee. Very diplomatically put, sir. Well done. <laughs> okay. I believe it though. Like I know it's hard. I know how hard it is to me, for me to make an Instagram. I can't imagine how hard it would be if someone gave me all the money in the world to build an education system. I couldn't do it right now. So, But it's not just that. It's that what do you, what do you educate on? The problem is that we call instant coffee coffee and we mm. call, uh, you know, coffee that is brewed in a siphon that takes an extraordinary amount of time uh, and, you know, with very expensive coffees, that is also called coffee. And so mm. commercial coffee, specialty coffee, which we don't have any clear real lines about what the difference of that is, all of these things blur the line on all of it. And For sure. And so when you don't have any clarity in the market, and I mean from the perspective of the consumer, when you don't have clear lines around what that is, the education that we're providing is not – everyone's going to be arguing about what the real definition of specialty coffee is and what a real coffee is. And so we get lost in, in all of that fuckery. And because we're mm. lost in that fuckery, we're, it's easier to just focus on competitions. Let's just go and, and get into competitions because that's easier because we can't figure out the rest. Go on. I, I think I think from my perspective, and once again, I do put it back to the age of our industry and the maturity of our industry as a whole. And I don't mean maturity in any 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 way other than I do think our, our industry as a whole has a lot of maturing and growth to do. Mm. I see it as it is hard to communicate and it is hard to educate an audience when it is um, – like you're saying, we're educating consumers. That's always a challenge because at the end of the day, does a consumer want to be educated or not? And I think all the foundations that are being laid in our industry at the moment are going to make that next generation have an easier conversation or that next generation I be able so. to have this kind of kind of perspective. So we can't we can't rush those things. We can't ex kind of expedite those processes. And when it comes to competition, if I could do one thing, I think as a coffee industry, we need to realize uh, as a specialty coffee industry, once again, how do we define that? 
Um, but as a, as a specialty coffee industry globally, we have the opportunity to focus on not competing with each other, but actually how do we raise the tide? So in my sense, we could compete with others by gatekeeping the information, the access, the insight, the technology, and make amazing coffee for ourselves, amazing purchasing decisions and do all these things. Or we can actually open it and open source it and democratize access to these things and say, if we get all boats to rise, if I can help every single Australian coffee roaster improve their costing and their budgeting and their forecasting for their green coffee, that's a win. That's a huge win Word. because that means we're going to have more independent roasters who have better financial structures so they can survive. That's a great thing. So it's like, yeah. I, I, want, I want to fight against this competition mentality. We see it in Australia, particularly about who charges how much for a flat white in Sydney and Melbourne and all this stuff. And our mainstream media here is horrible at the moment, to be honest, yeah. releasing where to find a dollar coffees, where to find this. And it, the big thing is, is we're not fighting with the cafe next door. We're not fighting with the, the cafe in Melbourne or down the road. We've got to try and find common ground to work together and then we can actually move forward. So I, I You're a was treasure to our industry, coast. sir. <laughs> I was, I'm from the Central Coast. I was raised by hippies, but I do believe in like, we have those opportunities to work together and actually move these things forward. And I'm myself and the team, we're putting all our energy on, on, on doing that. Well, and, and this is the kind of mentality that we're trying to foster throughout the industry, right? By building values-based businesses that actually work together with each other. When you have two values-based mm. business who want to buy products from each other, want to support each other, that's just strengthening what I feel like is an alternative coffee industry that I hope becomes the mainstream of what we're trying to do as a as an entire industry. And and I work really hard to make sure that they're the kinds of people that we bring on the podcast so that we can amplify the voices of those kinds of people. So I really appreciate the perspective that you're bringing, um, especially being somebody who is building a platform that amplifies and enables that kind of uh, business practices to all of the people who do what you do. But not just that, I think that you're, when you look at Gen Z that are coming through, they did not come to play. They are not here to take your minimum wage jobs and let you treat them the way that we got treated when we were baristas and we were, you know, puppy coffee roasters. Gen Z are not here to fuck around. And mm -hmm. they are going to take the examples that are set by the business owners like you and I and they're going to say, and this is how we're going to do it better. And that's exciting to me because they come with a lot less baggage than the generation. Like I'm a Gen Xer. They come with a lot less baggage than, than what those of us in Gen X have had. So I think that it's a, there's so much hope for the future, but there's a lot mm. of weight that we have to cut that um, – I think is naturally going to have to drop off because the times that we are in are so volatile that I, that it's, I mean, it's nothing but exciting. Everyone yeah, like, is going to be held to task. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm maybe this is why I do what I do and I've, you know, spent my career doing what I do, but I'm an optimist that there is, there is so much opportunity out there in this space. Mm -hmm. There's so much opportunity for us to improve in 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 our practices as coffee roasters as green coffee buyers so yeah like i'm i'm excited to see what the next generation does with the foundation we leave them and i'm working my butt off to leave them as best a foundation as i can yeah you are. i don't want to work forever so i'm ready to pass i'm, I'm ready to <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna i'm happy to pass the the, the candle over when i can the but second maybe not me, not you yet. can <laughs> amazing yeah, yeah. not just you not just yet you got some work to do ahead of you, bro. Um, okay, so in the next episode, folks, we're going to talk about how planning uh, your coffee offerings has changed given all the volatility that's in the system right now. So join us for the next episode. Peace, love, and peanut butter. Have an amazing rest of your day. I really hope you enjoyed this episode, friends. Please don't forget to show us some love by subscribing, liking, commenting, and most of all, sharing this podcast with your friends. Check the show notes for links, including our sponsors and our Patreon, and stay tuned for more great conversations on the Daily Coffee Pro by Mapper Forward.